Now we want to turn our hearts to our risen Lord and Savior as we pray together. Father, you are a great God and worthy to be praised. And on this Resurrection Sunday, we thank you for salvation through Jesus Christ, for being part of the family of God, for being part of a family that has power, power, wonder-working power because of the blood of the Lamb. We thank you, God, that you have brought us into your family. We're brothers and sisters in you. There's no male, no female, nor Jew, no Gentile, but we are one in you. By the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we are together, unified, and in harmony in you. And I pray, God, that you allow us each day to walk in that harmony, to yield to the control of your word, so that your word will dispel all doubt, all fear out of our heart, and that the joy of God will well up on the inside and allow us to stand strong and steadfast in your great love. Lord, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for their commitment to you. I thank you for their love one for another. And God, as we are distant physically, Lord, continue to allow our hearts to be close to one another. As we pray for each other, as we reach out with phone calls and emails and texts, God, allow our hearts to grow deeper in love with you and deeper in love and fellowship with one another. Father, I pray for those who are sick among us. God, we know that you are Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. And now, by the blood of Jesus Christ, God, touch them. Cover them with your blood. Heal their bodies. Father, for those who are bereaved, touch their hurting hearts and give them the peace that surpasses all understanding by your precious touch. Father, we thank you for your provision of food, clothing, and shelter. How you watch over us and provide for us, we thank you, God. We give your name honor, glory, and praise. And Lord, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity that you even give us now to be witnesses for you. To go and tell others that he is risen. He's risen indeed. And that the life, new life in Christ is available for them. That can rise from the deadness of the world that keeps them shackled in fear, shackled in doubt, shackled in a life of no control. They will be able to rise up and experience the power of God, the peace of God and the steadfast discipline of God in their lives. Help us to be faithful witnesses of this salvation story to a lost and dying world. We thank you for being co-laborers, being brought into your family to be able to share with those in need your love and your grace. We praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you. Look forward to sharing with you next week. the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is a wonderful day. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We praise God for allowing us to gather together in the study of God's Word. I'm Reverend Jerome Bell. I bring you greetings from Westminster Presbyterian Church, where God has allowed me to serve as pastor. And God has blessed us to see this wonderful day in which we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God is a good God and worthy to be praised. Amen. And I want to encourage you to join me, grab your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10 will serve as our platform for preaching. But I want to read verse 5 in your hearing just so that you will get an idea for our time of sharing. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. But I want to read verse 5. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen as he has said. Come, see the place where he lay. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. That is the affirmation of this season, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, as you and I, all with believers around the world, celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of the gospel writers give testimony to this wonderful fact that he is risen. Jesus Christ is no longer dead, and he rose from the dead. Mark chapter 16 Luke chapter 24 and John chapter 20 all give testimony of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul also 
gives witness to this wonderful, essential core belief of all Christians around the world that Jesus rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives testimony that there were over 500 believers who saw the resurrected Lord for themselves. And he talked about how the 11, the disciples, they saw the resurrected Lord. And then Paul, as he even saw him, the resurrected Lord himself, one who was born out of time. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential to our faith. Paul said in this way, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, it says, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. The resurrection is important. Understanding this fact, the simple fact, he is risen, is core to who we are as believers in Jesus Christ. So the story which we read today, Matthew's account of the resurrection, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, we, we get a glimpse, another angle, another perspective by another gospel writer's vantage point about the resurrection. And in the story we enter in, we read of some women who gather before the crack of dawn, early in the morning, still dark outside, but yet the hearts are aglow with a love and devotion for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They had just witnessed him being crucified. Matthew records in verse 55 of chapter 27 of Matthew's gospel that these same women who were Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, he records, they were at the crucifixion. They saw their Lord hanging on the cross. They were watching there. Out of love and devotion and the broken heart, they saw their Lord and Savior die. As he gave up the ghost, they were there witnessing. They even saw him when he was taken down from that cross. Joseph of Arimathea got his body and laid it in the tomb. And they were there when they saw Joseph and Nicodemus roll that stone in front of the tomb. They, they were there watching because they had a love and devotion. Here they were, driven by the same love and devotion. The next day, early in the morning, they got up because they wanted to anoint their master's body with spices. The text says, as they went, another scene at the tomb. The Bible says that the earth began to quake as the angel came and rolled away the stone from the opening of the tomb. Hmm. The guards who stood there watching over the tomb, the Bible says that they were Awestruck. They were frightened, gripped by fear, and began to shake, and they fell as though they were dead men. And the angel, in all of his brilliance and glory and shining, radiant majesty, set on the stone that he had just rolled away, and the women arrived at the tomb. Can you imagine coming on such a scene? Picture it. It's still dark. And you see a bright, shining figure sitting on the stone, which the tomb is open. It was closed, but now it's open, and there's an angel. And the guards are laying on the ground as though they're dead men. Can you imagine what will be coursing through your heart and mine? The angel said to the women, words of encouragement, don't be afraid. Because naturally, you come upon a scene like that, fear will grip you. You're expecting to see a closed tomb with a stone rolled in front, stones rolled away, and an angel with all of his radiant glory shining bright, and the guards are lying dead on the ground. 
as though they're dead, overcome with awe. Here they were, these women, these devoted, loving followers of Jesus Christ. The text says that the angel then said, I know who you're looking for, Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. I can imagine if this was a country boy like me, an angel, and if he said, he ain't him. He's not here. He is risen. He has risen. To those words brought for those women a sense of amazement that he's risen. He's risen. He's risen. And as the angel began to share these words that, that began to melt away their fear, their anxiety, he says, I want to give you another shred of evidence. Come and look in the tomb where he lay, past tense. He's not in here. Come and look. See for yourself that Christ is not in this tomb. He's risen. And they looked. Then he gave them a command, some instructions. Go and tell his disciples that he has gone before them to Jerusalem, to, to Galilee, where he was going to meet them there. And these women, following the commands of God's angel, the angel of the Lord, they hurried on their way, headed to tell the disciples what they had just encountered. And amazingly, the text says this was what was inside of their hearts. They had a strange mixture stirring up on the inside of their own bosom. Fear and great joy. According to verse 8, verse 28, excuse me, chapter 28, verse 8, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy in their hearts. What a mixture. They had came on the scene and they were gripped with fear by what they had saw, but they heard, one, that Jesus has risen. That was a great combat, uh, combated against the fear of what they had seen, that he had risen. What, what a great joy that reverberated, reverberated with those words in their heart, in their bosom, he's risen. But not only that, the angel gave them evidence, come and look in the tomb more joy. In fact, that phrase fear and great joy, the word great is translated from the Greek word which we get our word mega from. So in other words, he's saying they had fear and mega joy on the inside. Fear and mega joy on the inside. That their joy outweighed the fear. Beloved, you and I, if we're honest, especially in these days in which we live now, dealing with COVID-19, fear can rise up on our eyes. I'm watching the news over and over again, seeing what's happening around the world and even in the United States. Fear can rise up. Now, I know the Bible tells us in, in 1 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind, self-discipline, self-control, however the translation you read, that, that's true. But the reality is that the fear, yes, is not from God, it's of this world. The enemy comes in, he comes into our minds and tries to grip us and immobilize us with fear, just like those uh, the guards that were watching over the tomb when they were awestruck by the majesty of the angel, they were afraid, gripped with fear, and became as though they were dead. Fear can do that to us. Fear can immobilize us and cause us to become as though we are dead, not wanting to move, not wanting to, to keep living, to move forward, that we become overwhelmed by fear. But our text says they had a mixture of fear and great 
joy. Mega joy on the inside. Mega joy that caused them not to be gripped by fear, but to keep marching forward and going forward to share that good news of what, what they received and knowing that Jesus Christ had been risen, had rose from the dead. They had a great joy on the inside that governed them, that put fear in check. And beloved, that's, that's what you and I must do. We must understand that it is important for us to spend time, not a lot of time watching news or reading all of the reports in a newspaper, allowing those things to, to feed us, but we feed and feast on the word of God. For in this word, as the psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 111, he says, Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. Meaning the statutes, the word of God, is the joy of my heart. And if you and I want to make it through these days with a sense of overabundant joy, mega joy on the inside of our hearts, we must feast on the word. A good diet, reading the word of God, studying the word of God in our time of quarantine, not a time of just watching television or Netflix, but a time of spending some time in his word so that the joy of the Lord will become your strength to anchor you, to give you encouragement so that you'll be able to do like the writer of Philippians says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so these women went forward with that mixture of fear and mega joy on the inside. And as they went out of obedience, the Bible says that suddenly, or behold, Jesus appeared to them and he said these, this word, greetings. Some translation may render it as be glad or rejoice. He met them with a word of rejoicing, being glad. Greetings, sisters. He gave these first gospel message bearers a message to encourage their heart. Be glad, rejoice. Then he said, don't be afraid. The Bible says that their response was very interesting. When they recognized it was Jesus, their immediate response was to grab hold of his feet. They, they fell down and grabbed hold of his feet, and they began to worship him. They grabbed hold of him. They grabbed seemingly as though we saw you die, and, and, and you left us, but you're here now, and we ain't going to let you go. They reached out, and they grabbed hold of him. But I, I also understand that they the grabbing of Jesus was something that was part of their recesses of their heart. Remember I told you earlier that they were at the old rugged cross where he was hanging and dying between those two thieves. He was there dying. And he died in Mary and the other Mary and other women were there watching their Lord and Savior down the cross. And then we change the scene when they are laying Jesus in the tomb. Mary and the other Mary and the women were there graveside watching the Lord. They, they held on to him even after death. And we see them early, the beginning of the resurrection story, early in the morning, the heart still holding on to the loving Lord. And they rose up early to go and anoint his body. Why? Because they loved him. They were devoted to him. And love held a grip on their heart. And when they saw him again, naturally they reached out and grabbed hold of his feet because they loved him. And they began to worship him. They were on their knees, bowed down, prostrate, worshiping their God. That's the place where, where we must be in a position of humble adoration in the glory and majesty of our great God. Bow down in his presence. And beloved, it's best to bow now than to bow later. 
Because as followers of Jesus Christ, it should be natural for us to bow down and to worship him because we understand the glory and majesty of our God. He's worthy of us bowing down and paying reverence to him. The writer of Philippians, Paul, says these words in the second chapter, verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus Christ, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on in earth under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, we have to bow out of reference of our great precious holy God. And Jesus, after his devoted disciples, these women were there, he said, don't be afraid, I want you to go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. The word sounds similar to the command of the angel. Remember, the angel said to go and tell his disciples to go to Galilee and meet him there. Jesus says, go and tell my brothers. That's a closer term, right? It's a term that speaks of relationship, kinship. He, he speaks and says, go and tell my brothers, my family. That, that I'm going to meet them in Galilee. That's where we are. We, we are his family. We are brothers and sisters. We, we, we partake of uh, invitation to come and sup with him, to come and be with him. He promised never to leave us or forsake us. We are his, his family. Those who do the will of the Father, we are part of his family calls us and beckons us to come. And he tells these women to say, meet me in Galilee. Why Galilee? What's so important about Galilee? Well, Mark's, to Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 4, verse 15, the writer Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 2, verses, uh, chapter 9 of Isaiah, verse 1 and 2. These words, he speak from the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephilim, in the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. Not of the Jews, but of the Gentiles. Meaning that this place of Galilee was one in which all nations, all languages, all kindreds, all races, all tribes were there. At Galilee. What a wonderful place by which he would gather his disciples and share with them his resurrection. So that they would have a testimony like the women, these first bearers of the gospel. So they will go out and share with the whole world, not just Israel only but all nations. So they would know that Jesus, he is risen. And you and I, beloved, we, we hear these words where Jesus speaks to his disciples at the end of this chapter, of chapter 28. Read these words where Jesus speaks to his disciples. He says, verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This was a message that Jesus gave his disciples there in Galilee. Not only to them, but he gives it to us. To go. To go. And tell the world that he is risen. The resurrection power is available for you today. Not only for the purpose of saving you and transforming your life. But for the living of these days. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know 
I know who holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. He's risen, he's risen, he's risen indeed. Hallelujah, amen. the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we come together around this holy table to observe Holy Communion. As we look at these precious elements, the bread, We are reminded of what our Lord and Savior did for us on Calvary. In the season of Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this table means so much to us as family. This table represents not just holy communion, it's communion with God the Father. We are brothers and sisters through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because his body was broken, we are able to enter into fellowship. Because his blood was shed, we are all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we come to this holy table, we come with hearts of reverence. So I will pray for our time of communion. And then, if you need to, pause your video and go grab your elements so you can join us together while we eat of the bread and drink of the cup together. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for this precious gift you've given us. You've told us to do this in remembrance of you. So, Father, we consecrate this bread crackers, whatever we have in our homes to you, even now, to represent your body that was broken for us. And Father, we consecrate the cup, the juice of the vine, that represents your blood that was shed for the remission of sins. Because of this meal, this feast that we take together. It's a reminder of our fellowship that we have with you, that we are your friends, your family, and we commune in remembrance of the day in which we were baptized into the body of Christ and became part of the kingdom of God. Thank you for bringing us into such a wonderful fellowship. Bless this table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
on that evening, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He said to his disciples, Eat this, my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. Then Jesus took the cup. which represents his blood that was shed for the remission of sins. It says, drink this, do this in remembrance of me. The gospel account says, after they ate of this holy food together. They departed as they sung a song. I don't know what song they sung, but I remember when I was a little boy, we sung, I know it was blood. I know it was blood. I know it was blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise God for his blood that saved you and me.
I want to encourage you in this Easter season to continue our time of connecting with one another. As we connect hearts and minds, I want you to post a picture of you and your family during this Easter or even a previous Easter just so that we can celebrate and stay in the season of celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I love you.